I know the church is true. This is a phrase we often hear and say, but when do we know it? How do we know it? Is it okay if we don't know it? Today we're talking with Elder Bruce C. Hafen and his wife, Sister Marie Hafen, who have spent their married life exploring questions of faith together and with their family. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Erin Hallstrom, and I've been so looking forward to this conversation. Elder Hafen is an Emeritus General Authority, and Sister Hafen was a college English teacher. Both are the authors of the new book, Faith is Not Blind. Elder and Sister Hafen, thank you so much for joining us today. We're glad to be here. So, I think it's interesting that the way you met directly correlates to the book that you have, that you've written. Would you tell us a bit about how you met? We met in a class, actually, at BYU. It was a religion class. It was called Your Religious Problems. And we were very happy to solve one of our most important religious problems in that class because our friendship in the class developed into a romance which developed into our marriage. So we hope we are glad. We hope our children are glad. We think they are. But in that class, and it was a great class taught by West Belknap, who was then the dean of the College of Religion at BYU. And the format was that each of us would introduce a topic for discussion with the class, present what we had researched, and then the class would respond individually in writing, After write a very short paper after the class. The topics were, as the name of the class suggests, your religious problems. Some of them were church history. Some of them were Joseph Smith and polygamy. Questions were asked about race and the priesthood. But there were also questions from some about, how can I live my religion better? How can I be a more pure disciple? How can I have the Spirit more in my life? So we have had that since the beginning of our relationship, the opportunity to discuss issues that are difficult sometimes, but have answers. So that has been a tradition with us through the years, is to talk about difficult, interesting, complex issues. After each class, there were a few of us who would just keep talking about whatever the religious problem was. And our little conversation in our group would spill out of the Joseph Smith building onto the campus at BYU. Sometimes we'd wander down to the devotionals together. And so that's how we really came to know each other, was talking about the gospel and about questions. And they were faithful questions. We were curious. We were interested. And so that has just kind of naturally uh, sparked our relationship and our home ever since. And so, as in more recent years, as people have been talking about, what do you do when people have questions? That's just very natural to us. We say, well, what, what do you mean? What do you do? That's It's so fun. It's so constructive. We learn and... and uh, stimulate each other and our kids you know they've kind of come into the conversation uh, and yeah questions great. are good questions are a good thing in fact a recent example occurs to me uh, Aaron about this um, that, that relates I think to the kind of contemporary environment about this sure um, one of our kids told us that uh, just a few months ago one of their children, their boy, who I think was about 14, uh, walked up to his mom uh, one day and he said, Mom, is it okay to not believe in God? And instead of screaming <laughs> or, or saying, how dare you ask such a question, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but I think what she said was something like, uh, what a wonderful question. That shows you're thinking about really important <laughs> things. Let's talk. And and that um, I think that kind of mothering um, sees questions as a way to learn and grow. Questions are good in that kind of an environment. Well, I do think that there's we have a lot of fear around those kinds of questions because they are we don't always know the answers to them, right? I mean, 
I actually have a, I teach youth Sunday school and I taught a class just this last Sunday talking about how we receive answers to our questions, which is very interesting that that came just a few days before talking to you today. So I really do appreciate that. But I had them list all their questions on the board to start with, which was very interesting to see what kinds of questions they had were completely different than the questions I thought they would have. But um, but then we had we weren't going to answer the questions, and we had one kid that said, "Well, can't we go question by question and have you answer them for us?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, no, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to talk about how you how you receive the answers, and and you're going to f- receive the answers. And some of these don't have answers, or some of them." You need to find them in different ways. Anyway, I I find it it is interesting just that we have some a natural fear, especially with some questions. Some questions are hard. We have a natural instinct to to push back from them, right? So I love that example of a oh, that's interesting. That's great. What makes you think about that? Well, I like what you just uh, illustrated, Aaron. Your comment about encouraging your kids to go find their own answers is that resonates with us that's what we're trying to do when yeah. we are writing about faith is not blind and uh somebody who's working with us kevin knight uh, told us this experience from his childhood that illustrates i think what you've just been talking about he said when he was a little guy i don't know maybe six or seven uh people kept talking about eternal life and how long it yeah. was <laughs> And he kept, his memory is eternal life. He just kept puzzling over it. (laughs) And he said, that sounded so boring to me because I couldn't even sit through three hours of church. (laughs) But I didn't dare ask anybody because I could tell I was supposed to know what this was. And I didn't. And And so he said, I, in my boyish way, I went off and prayed about it. And he said, I remember after all these years uh, getting this kind of distinct answer, sort of thoughts in my mind. And, and, and it was simple. It was for me. And the, the response was, when I, what is eternal life? Trust me, it'll be good. <laughs> and he said that helped him. Oh, read, yeah. We've come to really like those two short sentences. <laughs> Trust me, it'll be good. <laughs> they apply in a lot of ways. Yeah, I believe it. That's beautiful. You've talked about that that this class and really this approach to answering questions or thinking about questions has really influenced your life and your family's life. How did that um, demonstrate, or how was that demonstrated in your like day to day life raising a family? I mean, I, I read in the book you talk about family dinners and that topics. was the one I was going to mention. Oh, okay, go ahead. The Italians call it tavola. It's the family table. It's the family dinner where everybody sits down together. And it's not only good food that they eat together, but they pass along culture. They pass along a way you look at life. They pass away along how you look at the church, how you look at your leaders, how you look at the scriptures, everything. So we just plan to sit down together. And it wasn't always possible, but as much as we could so that we could talk and we could share so that we could pass along those things that were important to us, and they could teach us what they were thinking about and what they were learning. So that was one thing. Yeah, I can think of a couple of illustrations of that. Uh, Well, one of them actually starts with my mother, so maybe this goes back a generation or two. Uh, In her final year, she lived next door to us, and she was sort of in her late 70s, early 80s, and she'd come and eat dinner with us all the time. And... uh, our wiggly little kids were all around the table. I mean, they, uh, we had seven children, and I think the youngest at that point would have been uh, maybe 10. Would that be right for Rachel? 10-ish, yeah. My mom, would, would right in the middle of dinner, she used to say, not making a big deal out of it, it was just conversation. She'd say to the kids, well, what did you do that was hard for you today? Hmm. And then we would talk about that, and, and sort of anything was, anything was fine. It was good to talk about that. And one time, after a few dinners like this, one of our youngest child said, "Why does Grandma always ask what did we do that was hard? Why didn't she say what did you do that was fun?" <laughs> and then years later, when she had her own little girls, I heard one of her little girls say 
to the, her sister, we can do hard things in our family. And I asked Rachel, who was not far away, I told her what they said. I said, how do your kids know about hard things? And she smiled and said, you know, you know how they know. <laughs> One other little example. Our daughter, Sarah, who's also been helping us with this project, who teaches English up at uh, BYU-Idaho with her husband, Eric Devonier, who also teaches there full-time. I don't know how old Sarah was, maybe seven or eight. She said one day, kind of flowing out of this atmosphere that Marie has described, and it wasn't, we didn't do it deliberately or manipulatively. It's just kind of the way we talked. It just came out of that religion class. Uh, Sarah said, Dad, when we meet Heavenly Father, I don't think we're going to say, Heavenly Father, can I have your autograph? <laughs> I think we just get to ask him anything we want, don't we? Mm. Perfect. Oh, I love that. I have plenty of questions that I have <laughs> thought about. That my, I had a friend that I have a friend who at one point would tell me that when when we die, my favorite thing is she says, "I'm going to go to that tent where you end." ask all the questions you have <laughs> and here are my questions and I've always thought about it that in my head I realize it's probably not a tent but <laughs> but I've always thought about that that idea of and we talk about eternal life being continual learning and that idea of that uh, we immediately get to seek more learning you know one, on one the more little side. example I might mention Aaron prerequisites to this family atmosphere and even our atmosphere in that class as our kids have asked us about our own experience we've, we've been open with them and for me, I grew up in St. George, a you know, very st- a strong Latter-day Saint community. I was in a, a wonderful uh, home, Latter-day Saint parents, married in the temple. We talked about the gospel. But when I was 19, I uh, stood at the pulpit for my missionary farewell. I simply could not bring myself to say I knew the gospel was true. I was kind of stuck on the difference between knowing and believing. Yeah. And I knew some people expected me to say, I know, but I just, I didn't understand how people could know. But I believed deeply. And rather than apologizing for that, I have, you know, our interaction with our kids, or I've talked this way to missionaries. And when we have visited missions and zone conferences, I've told them that experience. And I've told them that that Alma 32 was kind of my my little go-to personal Bible, because it taught me the process And it's similar to the process we describe in this book. Faith isn't blind. It's a growth process. You plant a seed and it grows. And Alma said, ye cannot know of their surety at first, referring to his words. But here's what you do. And then as you see all that he describes in Alma 32, this process is natural. It faces adversity. And he talks about nurturing the seed and the little sapling when the sun is burning hot, lest it wither. And I could understand that, and that has been my experience. And so that, so now, at this stage in my life, when I can say uh, to those missionaries or to our kids, I know the gospel is true. I, I know it by experience, not because I was saying what I thought I was supposed to say. So all my experience confirms, including the hard things. And you come out of the hard things, knowing things you couldn't have known if you hadn't gone through them. Uh, there's, I, I think of, of Moroni's words, you receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. So the trials are okay. And, and when you see that as part of the natural process, then uh, I think people can understand that. It makes sense. I mean, just to see them as part of the whole process sure, yeah. and an opportunity yeah, so you're not afraid of hard things, of questions, of new mm-hmm. experiences, because you you kind of you're prepared for that. You uh, it doesn't mean you know all the answers, but the process is natural. It's okay. That's part of being on the earth and learning from from opposition and experience. And I didn't know you before your mission, but I've heard you say before that. It was your mission itself and the experiences that you had there that helped you. By the end of your mission, you could say, I know, because of the experiences that you've had, the answers to prayers, the fruits of your labors, so to speak, people who had questions, who got them answered. And yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. In fact, maybe I 
should share a little example of that. Go ahead, that comes I love to mind it. When, when Marie mentioned that, uh, I've had reason to think of this example uh, in recent years because this issue has come up, uh, become quite public. In the early 60s, I was a missionary in Germany, and we met a wonderful American family. They were there in the service. They were in the early 20s expecting their first baby. And we taught them the first few missionary lessons, and they were just drinking it in. They were bright. They'd been to uh, church-related Protestant schools, so they, they loved the Bible. They loved the Lord. But they could tell this was more. This was new, and they, they read the Book of Mormon. They went to church. They prayed. They were ready to be baptized. And then they called one day and said they didn't want to see us anymore. Mm-hmm. And we were devastated, but they said, well, you can come and say goodbye. So so we went to their little apartment there in Frankfurt, and um, as we walked in, there was a very gloomy atmosphere, and Paul, their name, Paul and Wendy Knopp was the name, Paul said as we walked in, we feel like we've been set back 400 yards, and I thought, what is going on? We walked in and sat down, and the, Paul told us that they'd gotten a letter from home. He was from Oregon. His sister had married a wonderful Christian man from Nigeria, an African and they they were writing to tell Paul and Wendy, having heard that they were talking to the missionaries, don't talk to those Mormons. They discriminate on the basis of race. That's a racist church. And that really cut to the quick for them. That offended them. They thought it was wrong. And so they were saying things like, sure. you know, why didn't somebody tell us this? How could this be? God doesn't treat people differently. And... Uh, I was the senior companion. We sort of listened to all this and uh, just were totally stunned. And then they looked at me to to see if I had anything else to say before we left. I had never, never heard a discussion. I didn't know what to say. And yet in, in that moment... Uh, I just said, why don't we read Acts chapter 10? Now, where did that come from? A few months earlier in my personal scripture study, as a missionary just trying to learn the scriptures, I had read Acts 10 about the the experience where Cornelius receives a vision. He goes to Peter, who has received a vision. And that leads to this huge change in what the church was doing, offering the gospel to the Gentiles. And... I had never thought about that in this context at, ton context at all. We read it together, and I just sat there thinking, I didn't know this. Where did this come from? And so we talked about it. it was, and they were such dear people. Uh, they didn't, it's not like they were persuaded. We, just, we prayed together, and then we left. A few days later, they called and invited us back, and they said they wanted to continue they were later baptized and raised their kids in the in the gospel. Paul and Wendy went on a mission as a couple, and they're they're both died, uh, deceased now. Years later, when I we were remembering that pivotal night, and for me it was a it was a crucial step in in the movement from belief to knowledge. Yeah. I knew what the scripture meant when it said it will be given to you in the very moment, and. Wendy didn't know that. She didn't remember the scripture at all. It was she, she didn't have that context for why that was so significant. So all she said was, uh, when I said, what do you recall from that night? The, the darkness finally left us, and the light came back. Beautiful. I think the Knops illustrate a quality about approaching these subjects. They were like Nephi. They, they knew that the, God, that the Lord loves his children, but they didn't know the meaning at all of all things. And what I think their experience illustrates is they were open to a merely plausible explanation to something we couldn't completely answer. But they were willing to give the Lord the benefit of the doubt because of their attitude, and it did help to have a plausible explanation, even though it didn't answer all the questions. I would love for you to outline, you talk in the book about three stages of faith. And what are the different stages? The development, so what is, yeah, the development of faith, and mm-hmm. maybe it's we could base it, I think, really uh, quite well and accurately on a statement that came from Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., okay. the great judge. And we've come to love this statement over the last little while. It's been something new to us, even though these ideas generally 
about how to approach questions go way back, you know, okay. decades. Um, what he said was, I would not give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity. But I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. So with the Knaups, I think what, what they saw was everything was moving along fine. This is, they're, they're taking it in, they're praying, they understand it. And then the complexity with their family member and then the simplicity after complexity that came with peace. the spirit and the peace that they felt, this is right, we're moving ahead, it's something that we would love for us and for our family. But you did mention that there are three stages. Yes. So if the first one is simplicity, okay, then we could say that that is innocence, perhaps, uh, not tested by experience. Uh, maybe you could mention, because you can say it probably easier than I can, about the cloistered virtue. Oh, Marie's an English major, so... Uh, if whenever I can quote John Milton to to her, I know she'll. Then I'm listen. impressed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he's he's the one who said a phrase that we hear a lot, and some people have to think about what does it mean. Uh, Milton said, "I cannot prize a cloistered virtue." What's a cloistered virtue? A cloister is a place where people live who who shut themselves in, in from the world. They sure. they don't want to go out and deal with. With Real life. mortality. And so he's saying a virtue that is limited to the cloister. I think one of his phrases in the same paragraph where he talks about that is, a cloistered virtue is one that never sees her adversary. Doesn't acknowledge, doesn't confront. So to us, the, the phrase faith is not blind means true faith sees her adversary. True faith doesn't mm -hmm. stay in the cloister mm -hmm. to never hear the questions. Uh, it sees it. And faith isn't blind or deaf or dumb, so it overcomes the adversary. It overcomes the opposition. It overcomes the—it's a tested virtue mm -hmm. instead of a cloistered one. And, and then it's strong, and then it stays, and it's real. And I think that's kind of how mortality is and supposed to be. And that's, that's what happened with the Knops. And uh, when they faced the complexity— I've heard stories of people, other missionaries tell stories like that, and when people run into that very question, they just are so stunned that they don't want to hear another thing. It's, it's quite common to get stuck in complexity because it seems more realistic, more honest, uh, and, and so a lot of people get stuck. And part of what we're trying to say in this book is, first of all, we acknowledge that that can be hard. You can get stuck. It can feel like quicksand. So what do you do? And when parents or leaders see their own family members or the people they love going through that, what can they do? And our experience just confirms that you can get through this. In fact, it's natural to get through it, and your, your faith and your understanding will be stronger. You can learn from complexity rather than being overcome by it or disillusioned by it. So that simplicity then is stage one, but the complexity that you've mentioned is stage two. And we might also define complexity as you see the gap between what's real in your life and the ideal that you have assumed. And sometimes there is a jangling there. There's a mismatch. And so there's yeah. struggle trying to figure it out. So that's one kind of complexity is if you've got questions that you hear answers about and they're just going around in your head and you're trying to make sense of them. And then after stage two comes stage three, and some people... Then some people get stuck in the complexity. They don't... They, and then maybe they don't want to get out of the complexity because they think it's too hard or they think that in order to be honest with themselves somehow with what they've come to think, that they can't move beyond that. But the simplicity beyond complexity is an informed simplicity, a settled simplicity. So stage three is the simp stage is three. simplicity beyond complexity. Right. So it's very okay. different from the first simplicity. Yes. Because there's an awareness, right? Right. The, the lack an awareness of the, the seeing and it. An informed and experience. That's been added. Yes. And like you said, there's a peace about it. Even yeah. if you're in the middle 
of something hard. And this I, isn't complicated. We were driving on I-15 here in Utah the other day and saw a billboard that that states stage three. It was an ad for tires. <laughs> and, and it said, uh, let me see if I can remember. I think it was tried, true, and tested, something like right. that. Yeah, I, you want to drive on tires that are tried and true and tested. <laughs> That's why they test jet planes to make sure they'll fly. And so the the, the test has value, and and the, this is, it's a very natural concept. That's all we're trying to say. So, thinking about introducing complexity. By the way, I love the words that you use. I love I love thinking of it in terms of complexity because that that summarizes many things. It can be complexity around just difficult situations that arise in your life or circumstances or questions that come up or thinking about things that you know happened and not understanding how that works. I mean, I just think it encompasses a lot of things. So some of the complexity comes up for people because they didn't know it existed. And all of a sudden they feel like, you know, in in your example, why did no one tell us about this? Yeah. Yeah. Why didn't somebody tell us? Yeah. I mean, I was thinking it's so interesting because it's the exact same topic, but I learned in 10th grade, a friend of mine in school said to me in 10th grade, why do you belong to a racist church? And I said to her, there are many misconceptions about our church. This is not true. And I was so confident in my denial about it. And I went home and talked to my mom and said, did you hear this? Let me tell you about this one, this thing that I heard. And my mom had to tell me at that point, say, well, let me explain something to you. And that was the first. And I just realized I hadn't, it just hadn't come up in young women or in um, primary. But when do we start introducing some of these these topics? At great, what point? Yeah, great question, Erin. It, it, it's coming up now, uh, mostly because of the internet, mm-hmm. because everything is on the internet. Yeah. The internet doesn't discriminate about whether somebody is 3 or 13 or 103. And and so uh, when, when children get onto the internet to do research, as we've seen with our grandchildren, they run into stuff that that keeps that throws them from for, for loops, and so parents and leaders need. To, uh, at least we're finding, instead of being shocked about this, uh, we need to see the question as an opportunity to to give a response. Here's an example as recent as last Sunday. Uh, we uh, we were taking care of these three delightful little granddaughters because their parents were out of town. We decided to go to their own ward for their for church because they've moved into a new location. And as we were leaving church, our 11-year-old granddaughter was with a a good friend. They'd just been in class. I was just walking with them. I was just listening to the conversation. And one of these little girls said to, to our granddaughter, you know, we were talking about Heavenly Father in our class. Why doesn't anybody ever talk about Heavenly Mother? Mm-hmm. Now, I, I don't think an 11-year-old would have asked that when our children were that age. And I'm not quite sure why. I mean, the question has always been there. It's always been a wonderful question. But uh, people didn't talk like that. Well, there that was on the street, and they were kind of talking back and forth. They were interested in it. And, and I, I, was, I could tell they were... They were trying to find answers, and I was looking for a way to to not be preachy and not and not say don't don't ask questions. We don't know anything about that. I I found myself saying, you know, one of our most favorite hymns in our church was written by a woman named Eliza R. Snow, and it has in it a sentence that says, "A truth is reason, a truth eternal tells me I have a mother there." And and it's true. And then one of the, one of these little girls talked about how I don't remember the exact words, but it was something about we don't know as much about her, and there are really good reasons. I mean, she picked that up kind of mm-hmm. uh, from her parents or by instinct. But the atmosphere for that little discussion was constructive. It was peaceful. It was it, it was not confrontational. It doesn't need to be. So that she can begin to understand what that simplicity beyond complexity. Yeah. Yeah. Means. I'm thinking about a meeting where we were attending in the Utah State Prison. Bruce had a calling with the branches that are in the state prisons and jails. There are about 70 of them. And we were there on a day that was a testimony meeting. They're not able to have the sacrament, but they do invite the inmates to come and bear their testimony. This was in the women's unit of the Utah State Prison. Yes, so these were women dressed in their prison garb, sitting Mm -hmm. in the little chapel, 
in the prison, which Elder Ashton helped to make possible really? years ago. Yeah, Marvin J. Ashton. Mm-hmm. But one of them got up to bear her testimony, and you could just see this simplicity that she didn't— well, she might have given a fig for it, but then the complexity and then the simplicity after in what she said. Because when she started her testimony, she said, I can remember when I was a little girl. I loved to bear my testimony. I would just run up in front of the church, jump on that stool, and talk into the microphone and say, I know the church is true. My mom and dad love me. I know that Jesus suffered for my sins. And then she would say, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, and she would run back to her seat. But she said, then the years came along, and I ran into some real challenges and problems. And they were serious enough that I am here now behind these bars. But I can tell you that those same words... I love Heavenly Father. He knows me. Jesus suffered my si- for my sins. I know the church is true. They have an entirely different meaning for me now. And I'm working very hard to be able to use what I have learned here to change my life. That's so that beautiful. was, she had gone right through those stages, through hard experience. And who knows, maybe she became addicted to opioids. Maybe she became so addicted that she did things she would never have thought she would in order to have them. I mean, you don't know. Yeah. But she had gone through that experience. And then there's one other that I might mention, if that's okay, about a, a young woman that grew up in a very Mormon community in Rexburg, Idaho, And she was on automatic pilot as far as the church was concerned. She had her young woman's medallion at an early age. She was on track. And then when she was about 18, she heard from someone, you know, the church believes that women should not hold the priesthood. And she became really interested in that question. Well, why wouldn't women hold the priesthood? I mean, they're as good as men. They're as smart. They're, you know, they can do whatever they want. And she became so wound up in that that she just took her name off the church's rolls. A little later, a couple or three years later, she was at a university in Utah, but Utah State. And one of her roommates had become interested in the gospel and the missionaries were coming over. So she thought, hmm, you know, maybe, maybe I'll just sit in on those discussions. So she did that. And her heart was softened a little, and the missionaries had said to her roommate, why don't you pray about this? And our young friend had thought, hmm, it's been a long time. Maybe, maybe I will. So that night she knelt down and she said, Heavenly Father. And she said, the minute I said, Father, my heart just started to soften. It started to melt. And I began to feel this connection with him that I had not felt for a long time. And she said, over some time, as I studied, as I learned, as I experienced more, I developed what I would call a closeness with Heavenly Father. And she said that a little later than that, somebody that she had known when she had been so indignant said, well, what happened to those beliefs that you had, those challenges that you felt about women in the priesthood. And she just said, you know what? I don't worry about those so much anymore. He knows what he's doing. And I have other things, more important things to do with my life. Trust me, it'll be good. Yeah, trust me, it'll be good. (laughs) So those questions don't necessarily go away or get answered. No, exactly. And not immediately. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's over time. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, but for her, she it came when she was open enough again to take in what was really there, the simplicity beyond complexity, mm-hmm. the informed. She dealt with the uncertainties, with the disillusionment, sure. and was now back. You make a good point about that, Erin. I think it's important for, for all of us to remember what you were getting at, and that is we're not saying that uh, you get the answer 
you know, and you graduate. It's just now crystal. <laughs> right, and you graduate. You we, graduate. we only That's wish. That's what we all are waiting for, right? I just want to graduate. It's, it's with more all that my you have a perspective answer. about the context for the answer. You know, there are so many, so many things we can't understand yet. If we could, if we could just accept that, it would help. We're, we can't understand it until we're ready. Uh, and so, to, to just have a process that helps us uh, be at peace about the question as much as we can and when we're willing to give the Lord the benefit of the doubt trust me it'll be good with time our experience is we learn here a little there a little line upon line when we're ready we will learn more and that is just as natural as a child becoming an adult that's that's a that's a process for our spiritual growth as Mm -hmm. well as our biological growth there is a lot of fear involved when someone we love experiences doubt or has a tricky question. And I'm wondering at what point should we be actually worried? You know, I, and, and, and I use the word worried, but what I mean is at what point do we step in? At what point is this just a natural stage of, I mean, that's the thing I loved about reading the book and thinking through the stages is that we're saying, this is natural. This is what you kind of, should be going through. And instead of this fear of, oh no, my daughter or my, mm, yeah, my, you know, I, I'm, I've been a young woman's leader twice and you have this, oh, you know, <laughs> what am I going to do? We, are we going to, yeah. are we worried about this person? Are we going to lose them? You know, and we have that thought in our head about the, even, even talking about the losing them, even the language sometimes that we use, the, yeah. the no empty chairs, chairs. in heaven. Yes. Um, sometimes can be hurtful to some families who whose families don't look perfect in in the way that we think of perfect. Yeah, I think of Bonnie Parkin with that one when she went in and she was called. As she shared this at one time. She was called to be the General Relief Society president, mm-hmm. and she said, "But president, our family's not perfect." Who, she, who is she talking to? President As, Hinckley. Yeah, President Hinckley. Yeah. And President Hinckley said. I don't think there is a perfect family. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I kind of cut you off. No, 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 please. It's a good, good example and a, a wonderful question, Erin. I think we've all been there. We've been there. We can we? Know. Can we give her an example from our oh, family? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marie worries about me. <laughs> I worry about her. I think we, it's fine to. Uh, we've got to find a better word. The Australians, yeah, a better word. The Australians have a wonderful phrase called. In fact, I have a T-shirt that says this: "No worries, mate." <laughs> uh, I'm from Hawaii. We say no worries too. <laughs> uh, worrying is, is sort of it's a, it connotes a kind of fretting, and that fretting yes. comes across, and it can get in the way. And if that's one of the values of understanding uh, th- these issues with a larger perspective, do you think that our Father in Heaven is up there biting his nails over? Uh, over his children, even when he cries over them. Uh, you mean if he's not chuckling <laughs> well, when he sees some he of does the things both. we choose to do? But, but uh, it helps us to know that, yes, he feels deep concern. He's the God who weeps. He weeps over those who cho- make the wrong choices, but he is also the one who understands the process. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, 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 there's a different rate for, for every person. And I think... Uh, uh, and you're asking, when do you worry? Yeah. Did I cut you off? Did you? Work? Well, I mean, and my my thought is mainly: is there a point when worrying too early can be exactly to be to if your you point? Give them too much, it, more than the, they would need, or yeah, want. It can be counterproductive. It can be counterproductive because, because it blocks uh, it blocks the communication. I think uh, we know what that feels like. We have had to restrain ourselves and and kind of work at it to to just hold off. Uh, let let I remember a conversation with one of our teenage kids where I was so frustrated and she said kind of through her tears dad when you talk like that it makes me want to do the very things you don't want me to do <laughs> I'm never, trying, I've never experienced that <laughs> I'm trying to get through this would you just support me uh, it was an important message for me to hear and I think that's true on these kinds of questions uh, the questions are productive, and that's why knowing the process that we've been talking about is so helpful because it's not just a yes or no thing. We, we do ourselves a disservice when we say that f- faith and doubt are the only alternatives. 
there are lots of alternatives, you know, faith and doubt and wondering and wondering and curiosity and scratching your head. Uh, and I, I've concluded that uh, one of the reasons that that some of us don't know where we fit in all those terms is that our experience is larger than our vocabulary. Oh, I love that. And, and, and I, th- I think it was Richard Bushman talking about his experience when, when he was a young man at Harvard and was feeling like he was agnostic. And yet when he got a mission call, he said yes. And he would say, wait a minute, what am I doing here? <laughs> and then he realized that he was, it was a language issue. He didn't know how to explain the language in terms that his agnostic Harvard friends could understand. But he understood it. And and so he once said something like, a growth in testimony can be seen as an improvement in language. And, and so something, some of this is learning to understand. So as we're patient with each other and we listen, even though it, what, what we're hearing is not something we understand or approve of or wish we wish it were not happening, if, uh, if we can be patient and give people the benefit of the doubt in their own process and know that they... They want to find what's true, so let them let them get there and help them. Well, we're going to talk more in our next episode about... Yeah, you. we'd love to talk about Adam and Eve. <laughs> Great, let's do it. Next week, we will dig deeper into the three stages of faith, and we may even talk a bit about Adam and Eve. A big thank you to the Hafens for joining us. You can find their new book, Faith is Not Blind, at Deseret Bookstores. To listen to more episodes of All In, visit ldsliving.com slash all in.